survivors of the great blizzard of 2024. <laughs> so, again, I am not going to question God. I know the Lord is in charge of the weather. But it's just fascinating to me that you can have nice weather all week long. And then here comes Sunday morning, and what have you got? A blizzard. So, anyway, we're glad to see you. We're glad that you're here. And uh, we're going to worship the Lord together. Father God, we thank you for your love. We just pray that you be with us this morning. And Father, we pray that everything we do, everything we say, everything we sing, everything we study, would somehow come together in a beautiful concert of praise and worship to you. May Jesus Christ be lifted up. May God the Father be glorified. May the Holy Spirit be here in such a real way that we would sense your presence. What is it, Jesus? May we ask it. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is good to see you all here this morning. Wonderful to be able to be here with you and worship this morning. Our call to worship is from 599 number one. In the hymnal. And it should be on the screen here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and the let's see if we go see you in The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he is the King of glory? The Lord Almighty, He is the King of glory. Amen. We're going to turn to 106 and do a little bit of praise out of King. Praise Him, praise Him. All for your
great determination to get out of one of those new seats. They are so comfortable. I just wanted to sit down there. Yeah. I guess I could preach from there. You know? Who knows? Anyway, we do have some uh, announcements as we do get into the rest of our service this morning. First of all, we've got some birthdays and anniversaries for the month of February. And basically, the only one left is Shannon Jerome. And so, anyway, happy birthday and anniversary to everybody for this month. Moving right along, tonight in our evening fellowship hour, we have an objection. Was Jesus just a man? I mean, that's what some people say. Was he? Was there, was there anything special about Jesus? Well, tonight in uh, our video section, we're going to take a look at a video put together by Cold Case Christianity, where he deals with this objection. Was Jesus just a man? You know, if you talk to people on the street this afternoon, who went downtown and started interviewing people, do you believe in Jesus? Many people say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, he was a great moral teacher, but he was just a man. So come out tonight. Uh, about 5.30, we get together, and we have just some fellowship together, share some food together. It's almost like having a mini potluck uh, every week. So anyway, that's tonight at 5.30 and 6. All right, moving right along, the adult Sunday school class is studying the book of Psalms, and uh, we've been taking a look today at some of the Psalms of Ascents. Very, very interesting. Encourage you to come and join us. Then... The ladies are meeting on Thursdays at 10.30 here in the library, and uh, they have a great time of fellowship. They're studying the book of Esther, and Esther is unique in all of the Bible. There's something that is different about Esther than is different than any other book in the Bible. And if you don't know what it is, you need to come and Patty will explain to you on Thursdays. The men meet in my office. And uh, I don't know why I bother to feed them and give them something to drink, because all they do is give me a bad time. I tell you, it's, it's bad. So, you know, gentlemen, if you could come, I, I need all the help I can get, because I don't get any respect when these guys are <laughs> Anyway, that's Thursdays at 11 in the office. So our ramp, uh, if you have not been using it, please use it. Uh, it's very, very uh, enjoyable. Uh, it is great. It's going to last us a long time. They're almost done. They have to wait now until the weather changes in order to, to finish do, doing a few things. They, for some reason, they can't get out in a blizzard and paint. I don't understand that. But anyway, a few things that need to be done. But again, if you wish to contribute towards that fund, that would be much appreciated. Our coin jar project this year is for Congregation Beth Israel of Walla Walla. Again, I'm wearing one of these little blue tags, and people ask you, well, what is this blue tag all about? Well, it is, we are opposed to anti-Semitism, and anti-Semitism is rampant right now in our country. It's unbelievable, uh, taking place especially in our colleges and university campuses. And so we want to show that we are not anti-Semitic, we are for the Jewish people and the nation of Israel, and so that's what our coin jar project's about. As we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, again, I've had a prayer in the bulletin for several weeks. I encourage you to look at that. We need to be praying for the people. Um, I watched a video recently that talked about PTSD. So you have a lot of civilians that are traumatized by what happened. You have soldiers who are traumatized, watching their fellow soldiers die in battle, going in and having to do some of the things that they've had to do in Israel. But I did watch a video yesterday saying that Israel is unique. They are taking more caution about hurting civilians than any other military in the world. And so I know the news media wants to portray them as being evil and uh, as being uh, trying to obliterate the Palestinian people, that is not a, it at all. They're simply trying to defend themselves against Hamas. So please be praying for the nation of Israel. As we move on to our missions moments time, we have a video to show you that uh, is asking, what is this great commission all about?
incredible text made up of 66 different books written by more than 40 authors over a span of a thousand years. This is not just a compilation of a bunch of different stories, or a self-help manual, or even a devotional book. It is one cohesive story from Genesis to Revelation, the story of God's glory. Let's take a look at his story. In the beginning, God created everything for himself and his glory. At the pinnacle of that creation, he made man so that God could share himself with others. We were told to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth with the glory of God. But man decided that God couldn't be trusted, that he was holding something back from us. We decided to live for ourselves instead of for God, and this filled the earth with sin and selfishness. The generations of man had soon gone so far off track, in fact, that God flooded the entire earth and started over with a man named Noah. When Noah stepped off the ark, God told him the same words he had told Adam, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Once again, however, humanity looks to give itself honor instead of God. Because they all share the same language, it was easy to communicate and cooperate, so they made a plan. At a place called Babel, they would build a tower up to the heavens and in doing so make a name for themselves. They labored to build their own kingdom rather than obey God's command. They had made the same mistake as each of the generations before them. Since mankind had ignored his message to spread his name and his glory throughout the earth, God took matters into his own hands. He scrambled the languages of the people so they could no longer communicate easily with each other. In that moment, God had formed the many different tribes and peoples of the world, so the different people groups spread to the north, the south, the east, and the west. Out of those nations, God chose a man named Abraham and made a covenant with him. God told Abraham that he would bless him and all his descendants, turning them into a great nation that would bless all the other nations. God eventually called this nation Israel, and he began to demonstrate his glory through them in many ways. He gave them a set of laws to live by so that they could live separate and holy lives from all the other nations. In doing so, they would become his royal priests mediating between God and man. By living out his commands in the sight of the nations, Israel would encourage people to love God and love others. God also gave Israel a special geographical place on the earth, strategically located in the middle of all other nations. It was in this promised land that Israel would be a light to all nations, showing them the path to God even in the darkness of the world. Sometimes Israel would live out this calling well, understanding God's desire to bless all of the peoples of the earth through them. Other times, though, Israel would fall into the same trap that humanity had again and again, glorifying itself rather than glorifying God. When Israel got off track, God intervened. Sometimes he raised up prophets to remind them of their mandate to bless the nations with the blessings he had given them. Other times he would discipline his people by allowing them to be taken captive by other nations. Regardless, God used Israel, even in their disobedience, to make his name great throughout the earth. But all of this was just the beginning of what God had in store. In all of its ups and downs, Israel grew hungry for a promised Messiah King who would establish an everlasting kingdom that would never be defeated. That, of course, leads us to Jesus. God sent his son Jesus to earth for 33 years to dramatically demonstrate the Father's love for both Jew and Gentile alike. Yes, he was from King David's bloodline, but his genealogy had both Jews and Gentiles in it. His first worshippers were the wise men, Gentiles from the East. Angels proclaimed that his salvation would be for all peoples. Even his baby dedication identified him as a light for revelation to the Gentiles. Time and time again, Christ reminded his disciples, who considered themselves God's favorite, that God's plan from the beginning was to bless all peoples. His life modeled this message perfectly. He became angry when the temple wasn't being used as a house of prayer for all nations. He told parables about the kingdom of God being a kingdom for all people groups. And he preached good news to Jews, Gentiles, rich, poor, educated, and uneducated alike. Jesus served Canaanites, Samaritans, Romans, and Greeks. He was and is a true Messiah for all nations. He lived a perfect life, died a perfect death, and rose again with a perfect resurrection. Then, he commanded us to go make disciples of all nations. The 
perfect words to sum up his ministry. He told us that this gospel of the kingdom must be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all of the ethnic groups, and then the end would come. We saw the beginnings of this when the Holy Spirit filled the disciples at Pentecost and told the wonders of God in all the different languages of the world. We saw it continued when Christ called Paul and other apostles to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. It continues even now. We are waiting for the end that we see in Revelation, when the Lamb of God, Jesus, has purchased with his blood people from every nation. Those people will form a multitude that no one can count, from every tribe, tongue, and people group, worshiping and saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's the story of the Bible, a single cohesive story from cover to cover, God's story. The story of his glory among all the nations. But it can't come to fruition until all nations have heard. He invites you into that story. He invites you into that mission. What part will you play? So we now have the opportunity to be praying for those who are serving the Lord around the world today. We are uh, blessed by being a part of a group of people that has international workers around the world. If you take a look at your bullet this morning, I did put a prayer request in for creative access locations. Now, what are creative access locations? There are some countries where we can send quote unquote missionaries in, no problem. But there's other countries where they really don't want uh, missionaries. And so we have workers that we send into these countries uh, who do various jobs. For instance, they may be veterinarians, but their real reason for being there is to be able to witness and to help the church. And so recently, a Marketplace Ministries Educational Center fell under occupation by armed forces. The teachers acted swiftly and heroically, evacuating the children from the center to a nearby home. However, as the workers and children <coughs> were evacuating, several of the adults and kids were taken government by government troops. During their detention, they were forced to march alongside the troops and witness the horrors of war. They are understandably shaken. Praise God that they have since been released and are in the safety of the first evacuation. <coughs> the workers are currently assessing the safety of their current location and preparing for a potential evacuation to another site in case the situation becomes unsafe. Pray for God's hand of protection, wisdom, and peace in the situation continues to unfold. So we got to realize that many of our workers are in very, very dangerous locales. And here's one of those situations. Again, you notice it's kept anonymous because of the nature of the situation. So please be praying for that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your love, and Father, we thank you for our Coin Guard Project. Father, we thank you that we can encourage uh, Jewish people, even here in our country, that we are not anti-Semitic, we are not anti-Jew or anti-Israel. We are in favor of what God is doing. And Father, we would pray for the nation of Israel today as they continue this war. We don't like war. We don't see like anybody being killed. Father, we do pray that Israel would be victorious in eliminating Hamas. And Father, we realize that you have a plan for these people. And then, Father, we would pray for the Great Commission. We would pray for the whole concept that is a part of your word, from Genesis to Revelation, that we have a message to share with the peoples of the world. Help us to be a part of that. And Father, again, we would pray for this situation, for this creative access country, where these people are in danger right now. And Father, we pray for their protection and the guidance of those who are making decisions. Words in Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. All right, before I uh, share time, we're going to turn to number one. I'm going to handle his name is wonderful. And I love this scripture here of encouragement. It says, No one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, we pass it.
has lists, and again, we need to update some of these. Uh, you'll see Richard Green is actually on the list, but we had him up there further. Uh, many of you were on our uh, text-based prayer chain, got a request this weekend that uh, Richard and Myrna, who now live in Missouri, but often watch these uh, videos uh, online. Uh, Richard's in the hospital. He's been having a series of strokes. But the odd situation is they can't figure out why he's having the strokes, and there doesn't seem to be any permanent paralysis after one of these episodes. So uh, they moved him out of ICU. They're going to be doing further tests. So please be praying for, for Richard and Myrna uh, during this time. Uh, Steve and Carolyn Mosur are not with us. They had planned to be, but with the weather, uh, she needs to have her first appointment at Virginia Mason for her chemotherapy tomorrow. So they, they're on the road already trying to get over to Seattle. Mm -hmm. So please pray for their protection. Chemo goes well. Um, unfortunately, they're going to have to drive home after every treatment. And of course, if she's not feeling well, that'll be a, a long, long trip. So please be praying for them right now. They're very cautiously optimistic that uh, they can treat this. So be praying for her. Then also, our grandson Bart is also on the road, but not going to Seattle, coming back from Tacoma. He was over there for this uh, state wrestling uh, finals. So please be praying for him. And again, uh, there's other names on this list. I don't want to go down the entire list. Uh, pray for Lynn Grant. I got to see Lynn this week. She is still at home, uh, living by herself now that White has passed. And I've got to be honest with you, I was pleasantly surprised. She looked better and sounded better to me than the last time uh, Dan and I went to see her and uh, Dwight was still with her. So I don't know if this is causing her to kind of pull, pull it all together, you know, or what. But uh, anyway, please be praying for her during this period of time as well. All right, any other requests that we need? Yes, Vicki. Well, I have a couple. Um, yes. So I was in the ER with Vicki Erickson Thursday night. She had pain on her left side, and they couldn't explain it or, or find why. And she's still in a lot of pain. It's in her heart. So prayers that she either it goes away or they find out what's going on with her. Um, prayers for my daughter, Shauna, um, her husband, David, they're in their, and my grandson, Lash. They're in Austria right now. They're going to be leaving Lash in Austria for school um, abroad um, for several months. And they just found out um, that there's a strike in Germany, which now they delayed their plans on flying out tomorrow oh to later this week. And my other, my 16-year-old grandson is at home alone. So prayers that it all comes together, everybody's safe and they can trip home. So. Okay, very good. Sandy Sunbob is in the hospital this morning having stent placement. Okay, Sandy Sunbob is in the hospital. Why? Having stents put in. Oh, stents. Oh, okay. For Paul, I don't know what exactly is wrong. Well, my um, wife's cousin has an adopted son who is severely disabled, and um, he had uh, a brain issue a couple years ago. Since then, has been at home, but basically is in what you might call a vegetative or semi-vegetative state. Anyway, they have had to airlift him back to Virginia Mason in Seattle. We don't know the issue. Um, my wife's cousin and her husband could not have their own children. And uh, they desperately wanted to have a child. And uh, this little boy, Paul, was born very disabled. And when his parents realized how bad he was, they took him back to the hospital and said, we don't want him. And so the doctor called my wife's cousin and said, would you take this little boy? And they said, gladly. And they have literally dedicated their lives to his care. And it's been very, very difficult for them. Paul, when he was uh, more alert, uh, was a joy to be around. But imagine taking care of somebody who's basically in a vegetative state day after day, day after day. So, yeah, these are these are prayers. <clears throat> okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your love. And Father, again, we would remember all of these requests this morning. Father, again, these are more than names on a page. These are more than names that we list verbally. 
you care about each and every one of these people. And so, Father, we lift them and put them into your hands, praying for a miracle that you would work. In Jesus' name, we ask it. All right. Well, if you uh, have been doing your Through the Bible reading, uh, very, very interesting. Uh, this week, we are in Leviticus, which uh, is a very difficult passage to read. I've got to be honest. I, I understand that. But I saw a real contrast, okay? So, in reading Leviticus, you have one offering after another, and all these animals are supposed to be killed, and all the blood that's supposed to be shed, and all of this. And i, I got to be honest with you, I, I tend to do what some of you do, kind of skim down through it, read some of the important verses here and there, but it's difficult, okay? So, I'm reading Leviticus and all these offerings, then I go over to Matthew, and I read about Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who dies on the cross and sheds his blood once and for all. I am so thankful that we are not back in the Levitical period, that we still have to, to sacrifice these animals. Uh, to have taken an animal to the tabernacle, and to put your hand on that animal's head, and look it in the eye as you kill it and shed its blood. Uh, you can imagine what that would be like. And uh, anyway, so and then reading this crucifixion of what Jesus Christ went through for us once and for all. So what a tremendous, tremendous passage of scripture. What a what a contrast. And then of course in the Psalms, uh, the one verse that I wrote down from my reading was. Delight yourselves in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. Now that is not a blank check. It doesn't mean that God will give you anything you want. But it means that he will inspire within you desires to live for him and to serve him. And to do, you, to do what you want to do for him. It's not just God, you know, give me this or give me that. So anyway, fantastic passage. All right, we are in the Gospel of Matthew this morning, and we're going to be taking about taking a look at greatest in the kingdom of God. So there are some people who have nicknames. You remember Muhammad Ali? I remember when he was some Cassius Clay. That's how old I am. Anyway, he's known as the Great One, you know, or Jackie Gleason. I'm, again, dating myself. Remember when he was on TV? You know, he was the greatest or the great one, you know, too. We tend to idolize people in our society based on their greatness. So, for instance, now a lot of people are talking about the Super Bowl from last weekend and the fact that Kansas City cheated to win, you know. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. They didn't cheat. But Patrick Mahomes, is that how you pronounce his last name? Yeah. People are now talking and saying, is he the greatest quarterback, you know, in NFL history? Uh, you talk about different sports players. They're the greatest of this or the greatest of that. You talk about actors or actresses. Oh, they're the greatest of all time. We tend to really emphasize when somebody is great. Okay? Well, Jesus is going to deal with that issue amongst his own disciples this morning as we take a look at this passage of scripture. And it is not what we think that it should be. All right, so this morning our key verse is in Matthew chapter 13, verse chapter 8, verse 3b, where it says this, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. What in the world does that mean? Well, the point that we want to make this morning simply is this. The greatest in God's sight may be the weakest in the world's sight. Huh? That, that almost sounds like what we would call an oxymoron. You know what an oxymoron is? Something that seems to be contradictory. You know, like talking about an honest lawyer or something like that. <laughs> So when God looks at his kingdom and he determines who is the quote-unquote greatest, many times we would consider them to be the weakest. 
So the question that I need to ask myself is, am I great in the kingdom of God? So two things very briefly this morning. The question regarding the greatest in the kingdom, and then the answer regarding the greatest in the kingdom. And again, it's not what they expected. It's not what we would have expected at all. So, um, my laptop did some really, really strange things, and I don't understand why. So I can't read everything that's on here, because it looks like my laptop is speaking in tongues. So uh, when it comes to verse 1 of chapter 18, it's all gobbledygook. But uh, if I remember right, it's when the disciples come to him saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They're asking Jesus a question. Who is the greatest? Well, they doubtless fancied a temporal kingdom of the Messiah in which places would be bestowed. Okay? You understand what that means? They thought the Messiah was coming now to set up his earthly kingdom. They thought that Jesus was going to march on Jerusalem, kick the Romans out, sit on his throne, and who was going to be able to rule and reign with him? And these are going to be places of great honor. They dreamt of a distribution of honors and offices, a worldly monarchy like the kingdoms of the earth. You know, it's interesting that if you go to the Gospel of Mark, you have a very similar thing going on with James and John. You remember that? In Mark chapter 10, verse 35, it says this, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want that whatever we may ask you, you would do for us. He said to them, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and the other at your left hand in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Can you drink the cup that I drink? And be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We can. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink the cup that I drink, and be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. But to sit at my right hand, or at my left hand, <clears throat> is not mine to grant. It is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard it, they began to be very displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are appointed to rule over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever among you would be greatest must be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came to be served, not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. It goes totally against our, our, our grain of, of thinking. You know, what we're supposed to get in this society is wealth, riches, power, you know, authority, health, whatever. And so Jesus' disciples, you know, they're thinking, wow, the kingdom's coming. This is the king. We want to sit at his right and left hand. Now, again, you've heard about somebody being somebody's right-hand man. Okay, back in those days, uh, if, if you were at the right hand of the king, that meant you were next in line for authority or power. Very influential position. If you were at the left hand, well, then you were next to the right hand. Interestingly enough, it says that when Jesus Christ died on the cross and was buried, rose again and ascended, he ascended where? To the right hand of God the Father. Okay? So, this question that they have for him is totally inappropriate. First of all, in, in Matthew, they're saying, who's the greatest? You know, is it me? Am I the greatest? In, in Mark, they're saying, you know, we want to sit at your right and left hand. And Jesus is saying, you don't understand. If you want to be 
greatest in the kingdom, you must be the servant. Now, again, in Jewish thought, the lowest person in a household was the servant. That's why, you remember the Last Supper, when they show up in the upper room? Jesus takes off his robe, gets his towel around him, gets down and wants to do what? Wash their feet. Now, in a Jewish home in that day, the lowliest child and the lowliest servant was the one who did the foot washing, not the master of the house. And Peter says, oh, no, 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 you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I don't wash them, you don't even have a heart. Oh, then wash my whole body, you know. But Jesus was living out servanthood in front of them. So Jesus says that he came. Here is God. The God man, God the Son, comes not to be served, but to serve. So he's turning everything upside down and around. All right, so that's the question. Now let's take a look at the answer. And again, I can't even read the answer. Lord, there's so many things on my screen now that have gone totally gobbledygook. Huh? Okay, we are now on answering regarding the kingdom. So this would be... That's okay. But you know what? I'm going to need that notebook on any beauty because I cannot read my iPad this morning. I don't know what happened to it, but it looks like it's trying to speak in tongues. Uh, honestly, it's, it has redone a lot of reverses to just totally gobble you. Well, forget the screen. Just listen to the guy behind the pulpit. <laughs> okay. Oh, there you go. Okay, now next slide. Ah, oh, there you go. That's where we're supposed to be. All right. Thank you, Vicki. All right. So, the answer regarding the greatest in the kingdom. Verse 2. Jesus called a little child to him and sent him in their midst. Okay, get the picture here. You got these disciples. Okay. They, they think that they're powerful men. Because they are now associating with the Messiah. They want to know who's the greatest. And Jesus says, to them, hey, bring a little child to me. Huh? A little child? Yeah. Jesus might have answered the question, who is the greatest, by pointing to himself. Instead, Jesus drew their attention to his nature by having them look at a child as an example. What's going on here? By the way, it also tells us something about Peter. Now, again, I'm not trying to be critical here, but let's put this in perspective. If Peter really was to be regarded as the first pope in the way popes are regarded by Roman Catholic theology and history, Jesus should have declared that Peter was the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But he doesn't do that, does he? Verse 3. And said... Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, this was probably a great disappointment to the disciples. They knew that in that day, children were regarded more as property than individuals. It was understood that they were to be seen, and not heard. Jesus said, we have to take this kind of humble place to enter the kingdom, much less to be the greatest in the kingdom. What? What is Jesus talking about here? A child was a person of no importance in Jewish society, subject to uh, the authority of his elders, not taken seriously except as a responsibility, one to be looked after, not one to be looked up to. Isn't that interesting? Okay? They come and say, Jesus, tell us, who's the greatest? And he says, bring a little child over here. By the way, that says something about Jesus, doesn't he? You know, we often portray him 
you know, this ferocious looking view. He was very humble. He was very loving. He sat down. A little child came over to him with no fear whatsoever. You know, sits on his lap. And now Jesus is saying, if you want to be the greatest, you've got to be like one of these. And yet, in Jewish society, kids, they weren't anything. Okay? The child is held up as an ideal, not of innocence, purity, or faith, but of humility and unconcern for social status. Wow. Verse 4. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this little child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What? Humbles himself does not refer to arbitrary asceticism or a phony false modesty, but the acceptance of an inferior position, as Jesus did. You know, did not count himself equal with God, set him aside, to, aside you know, as a servant, as a suffering servant. Have you ever met somebody who claims to be humble? <laughs> They're very, very proud of their humility. <laughs> and you think to yourself, boy, there's no humility in their household. He's got it all. You know? <laughs> but this is an honest evaluation of who you are. <laughs> And again, if the disciples thought about it, they were all sinners. They all fell short of God's glory. They all fell short of God's purpose. None of them is the greatest. God has chosen them, not because they're the greatest, but maybe because of, their, of the least. You know, take a look at Matthew, who's writing this book. Remember when we went through the call of Matthew? What did we say about Matthew? Matthew was what job in life? <coughs> A tax collector. The Jews hated tax collectors because they were working for the Roman government. And not only were they working for the Roman government, but they were dishonest. I mean, the government would say you have to collect X number of uh, shekels. Well, once they collected X number of shekels, anything they collected above that was theirs. You know, they hated tax collectors. And yet Matthew's the one who's writing this. So, I do not know what happened to the rest. Ah, okay. <laughs> Verse 5 says this. And whoever receives one such little child in my name receives me. All right. So there's two things here. There's a question regarding the greatest in the kingdom. The answer regarding the greatest in the kingdom. And then Jesus gives us an illustration. If you turn to the Gospel of Mark, you'll know that this is the last week of Jesus' life. They've gone to the temple, and he's having it out with all these different temple authorities. You know, they're, they're trying to trip him up like the Sadducees come along and say, you know, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Things like that. Finally, they're getting to leave, ready to leave the, the temple, and Jesus looks over at the treasury where they're making all of their offerings. And in Mark chapter 12, verse 41, it says this, Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. Many who were rich put in much. But a certain widow came and put in two mites, which made a farthing. He called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. They all contribute out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had her entire livelihood. All right. If you had been one of Jesus' disciples that day, and you had watched these rich guys come in, and they had these big buckets of, of coins, and they would walk, walk up to this thing that looks like a trumpet, and they would start pouring their offering in, and so as the money went down, it went clink and clank and all this and make a big racket. You think, wow, look how great they are. Look at what they're giving to the treasury. You wouldn't have even noticed this poor little widow lady who kind of shovels over, reaches into her bag, pulls out the tiniest Roman coins available, the smallest. 
And when she drops them in, you don't even hear anything. And yet Jesus says that she has given more than all of the rest. You see, she is great in the kingdom. Those rich guys pouring in, they couldn't put in a lot more. They are low in the kingdom. You see, Jesus turns everything upside down here. Isn't that incredible? So remember what our key verse was this morning in Matthew chapter 18, verse 3. Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. The point simply is this. The greatest in God's sight may be the weakest in the world's sight. So the question is that I need to ask myself, is am I great in the kingdom of God? If I think I am, I'm not. If I'm trying to be, I'm not. It's like Jesus turns everything upside down. You know, many people today, if you were to ask, who's the greatest Christian, well, at least in the last century, many people would say, oh, Billy Graham. He had to be the greatest. He preached to millions and millions of people. And if you ask God, who's the greatest in the last century, he might point to some little widow lady who you've never, ever heard of in your life, who did incredible acts of servanthood to her church and to her friends, like Dorcas did in, in, the, in the Book of Acts. We need to stop looking at things the way the world looks at things and start looking at things the way God looks. Father God, we thank you for this tremendous story. And Father, we just pray that you would encourage our hearts. Father, it's our desire to be the greatest. Instead, help us to have the desire to be a servant. You are a servant. Help us to be willing to live for you and sacrifice for you. For it's in Jesus' name we ask these things.
Help us, Lord, as we go through the rest of the day and the rest of this week, that we might bear in mind how blessed we are because of who you are and what you have done. Thank you so much, too, for your compassion on the young, the little among us. And help us, Lord, to be little in our own sight, that we might be in some way useful to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah.